Welcome to Tiski Sao. We have three massive stories for you tonight. The Amnesty International Report, which has found that Israel is an apartheid state. We're going to talk about how centrists have belatedly come to the realisation that smears are actually quite bad. That's after five years of, of pushing them off their own Twitter feeds and their own radio stations. And we are going to end by talking about Jimmy Savile. Now, we're not going to focus on the relationship between Jimmy Savile and Keir Starmer, which seems incredibly tenuous. We're going to talk about why people in government or in the Conservative Party should actually be worried if we have a renewed focus on Jimmy Savile and his historic crimes. You know, we haven't had a headline breaking news day today. That actually means we can sometimes take on more interesting stories. Um, you know the score. We want to know your comments, your questions. You can tweet them on the hashtag Tisky Sour or put them in the comments box. It's official. Israel is an apartheid state. That's according to Amnesty International, who after a four-year investigation have found that the Israeli government treats Palestinians as an inferior racial group to the benefit of Jewish Israelis. They have said that Palestinians are systematically deprived of their rights, whether they live in Gaza, East Jerusalem, the West Bank, or within the borders of Israel. In the report's summary, they write... Amnesty International has demonstrated that Israel has imposed a system of oppression and domination over Palestinians wherever it exercises control over the enjoyment of their rights across Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories and with regard to Palestinian refugees. The segregation is conducted in a systematic and highly institutionalized manner through laws, policies and practices all intended to prevent Palestinians from claiming and enjoying equal rights to Jewish Israelis within Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories and thus intended to oppress and dominate the Palestinian people. This oppression and domination have been cemented by a legal regime that controls by negating the rights of Palestinian refugees residing outside Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories to return to their homes. The claim that Israel practices apartheid has long been put forward by Palestinians, but has only recently been adopted by mainstream human rights organizations. That includes Human Rights Watch, Betzalem, and now Amnesty. The term exists in international law and is defined as an institutionalized regime of oppression and domination of one racial group by another. Apartheid was, of course, originally the name given to the system of racial domination that existed in white-controlled South Africa. Apartheid literally means separateness in Afrikaans. Under that brutal regime, millions of black Africans were moved from their homes into segregated neighborhoods or Bantu stands. They were denied employment opportunities. Mixed marriages were banned. After the fall of South African apartheid, the term gained a more general meaning. The crime of apartheid was referenced in the 2007 law that created the International Criminal Court, or the ICC, where it is named as a crime against humanity. Speaking to CNN, Amnesty International's General Secretary Agnes Kalamard explained why they had applied the term to Israel. We call it apartheid because it is apartheid under international law. We have uh, spent four years investigating on the ground, conducting legal analysis with some of the best legal minds on the crime of apartheid. What we have found is a system, a system of laws, policies, practices, intricate, bureaucratic, bureaucratized, um, that are uh, there in order to ensure control and domination of the Palestinian people and in order to ensure um, demographic hegemony of one racial group uh, over another one, and in order to ensure maximal control over the land. That is the definition of a system of apartheid. That my, you know, this is my first visit to, um, to Israel OPT, and I was shocked to the core by uh, finding the extent of the segregation within those societies, the extent to which people are separated, people are unequal, the extent to which apartheid and the system has been internalized to the extent that it is becoming almost banal um, and, and absurd at times. Right. That is system of apartheid. Earlier today, I spoke to Yara Harawi, a writer and senior policy analyst with Al Shabak, the Palestinian Policy Network. The system permeates everyday life for Palestinians, and, and sometimes we have to st take a step back and, and realize, you know, the things that are happening in our life are because of the system, because it's been so normalized and it's been ongoing for so many decades. The fact 
that your movement is dictated uh, by this regime, who uh, you're allowed to marry, um, you know, all these very intimate aspects of your life are dictated by this apartheid regime. Um, and it's, you know, it, it was described, I think, by uh, by the head of uh, Amnesty International as as cruel and 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 just the intricate details that just seem so uh, silly and pathetic, but they actually have very lasting traumatic uh, impacts on on the Palestinian people. Could I get you to expand just on that point that I think many of our audience will find shocking? You say they control who you can and cannot marry. Could you sort of explain that a bit more? Palestinians are divided into different categories or, or, or classes, as it were. So. Uh, West Bankers, uh, Palestinians in Gaza, Palestinian citizens of Israel, Palestinians in exile, Palestinians in Jerusalem, and and each are sort of uh, categorized by the Israeli regime. Um, And so if you are a Palestinian living in in Jerusalem, you are given permanent residency status, Um, but there's nothing permanent about that status. They can withhold that status from you if you choose to live outside of Jerusalem. Um, if you live outside of Jerusalem, it might mean that they take it away and that you can never live in Jerusalem again. And if you so happen to uh, fall in love with a West Banker, that West Banker is not allowed to live in Jerusalem with you. So quite often, Palestinians are forced with the choice of of having to choose uh, the person that they love or the city that they love. Um, and so it's really, it boils down to these very sort of uh, intimate uh, invasions and in, in, into life. And the same for a Palestinian citizen of Israel. If they uh, choose to to marry a West Banker, they have to make that choice whether to live in the West Bank or whether to live um, inside the 48 territories. We've seen in the last year or so, but Salem, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty all now come out and say that Israel is an apartheid regime. Do you think that reflects a worsening of the situation on the ground. And so all of these human rights organizations now have come out and said, yes, now it now it meets that threshold. Or do you think something else has changed? That the reality on the ground has been the same for a long time, but potentially something has changed in, in those organizations or in that human rights scene? I definitely think the regime is being cemented on the ground. You know, every day that passes, you know, there are more facts on the ground, more settlements being built. Um, the Israeli regime is uh, is becoming more intricate with its system of oppression. I don't know whether that necessarily means it's a worsening in terms of the daily experiences of of Palestinians. But what I think is happening in the human rights community is this is this shift uh, that's sort of reflecting um, what the Palestri- Palestinian street has been saying for decades. You know, this is one system of oppression uh, from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea, and it ma- manifests itself in different ways. I think the thing with the Israeli human rights organisations recognizing that this is an apartheid regime says a lot more uh, about them coming to terms uh, with the reality than it does about the uh, the actual situation for Palestinians. These human rights organizations coming out with, you know, these very definitive statements, I think that will be influential among, you know, the international progressive scene. Um, potentially, it'll be easier to put pressure on on some Western governments, although that's kind of up in the air. How will the Israeli government interpret this? Will they in any way look at this and think, oh, you know, we've we've been found out, we need to in, in some ways change our ways or make our oppression a bit more subtle? How, how do you think they're reading this report? We've already seen how they've responded. They came out ahead of the report saying that this was going to be an anti-Semitic document that Israel is being singled out, um, usual by the human rights crowd, and more focus on China or Iran, uh, which is amusing because Amnesty does focus quite a lot on China and uh, Iran. But this whataboutism is is really a distraction. The Israeli regime uh, has been given this this green light by the rest of the world. And by that, I mean it's, the rest of the world is entirely complicit in the Israeli regime of apartheid, not only through various different trade agreements and, and technology exchanges, but also weapon sales. You know, the British government is very complicit in the Israeli apartheid regime. And, and you know, just to add salt to the wound, there's currently a, a British uh, government trade delegation in Israel posting about being in Israel when they're actually posting pictures from East Jerusalem the day after Amnesty releases this damning report um, so I don't think there's going to be any seismic policy shifts. I don't think the Israeli government is going to be more subtle about their apartheid regime because they don't need to. 
the you know the Western world for the most part is very comfortable with their relationship um, with the state of Israel. Lots of our audience watching this will be in Britain. We do have people watching from from all around the world. If people have you know, looked at the contents of this report and they're outraged, what do you think people can possibly do to try and change the situation on the ground? The easiest way that people can stand in, in solidarity with the Palestinian people is to join the, the boycott divestment sanctions movement, which is a, a grassroots Palestinian-led movement um, that has uh, branches and has groups all over the world working together in tandem uh, for the, 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 the Palestinian struggle and for Palestinian fundamental rights. It's modelled on the anti-apartheid South African struggle, um, which saw great success in boycotts and divestment and sanctions. Um, and indeed, the, the Palestinian BDS movement has been very successful in its boycotts and in its divestments. Where we now need to focus is on state sanctioning. And it is indeed a long way off. But I do think uh, with enough pressure from uh, people around the world, there is a possibility uh, for that change to happen and for governments to to follow suit, just as they sanctioned uh, South African apartheid. Um, I think it is entirely possible that we might see uh, governments sanctioning Israeli apartheid not in the near future, but I think it's a long-term goal that we can certainly work for. It might be far in the future, but do you have an idea of what those sanctions would look like? Would you be sort of envisioning a sanctioning of, of people in the government and people close to them? Or are you, you imagining kind of export bans from, from Israel? What, what kind of sanctions would you be calling for, for other countries to be imposing? All of the above, I think. Uh, and the Amnesty report actually offers um, some uh, good uh, recommendations for third state parties that includes uh, uh, stopping weapons uh, sales to the Israeli regime. And that's something uh, that I think everyone uh, who, who supports the Palestinian struggle should be campaigning for. But also uh, going after individuals, Israeli individuals who have committed war crimes, who have been um, um, you know, played major roles in the apartheid regime. Uh, third party states should be should be exercising their universal jurisdiction to hold those people accountable when they're under their own dis- uh, local jurisdiction. Um, so I think there are plenty of mechanisms, uh, legal and otherwise, um, to to hold Israel accountable. But I think there needs to be a, a really a global shift in politics uh, before that starts to happen. Let's go to a comment. So Saul says, one factor that helped defeat apartheid in South Africa was mobilizing international opinion to view it as a pariah state. This is what apologists of Israel apartheid are fighting hard to present. Um, prevent, sorry. Absolutely. I mean, we, we are seeing now the pushback against this Amnesty International report, both from you know officials within the Israeli regime, but also um, from many people in British politics, which is going to be the topic of our next section. The release of Amnesty International's report into Israeli apartheid is a good time to remind ourselves of how deeply Britain is implicated in the crimes of that regime. Most directly, that's because we supply Israel with some of the weapons used to enforce apartheid. Between 2016 and 2020, Britain sold £387 million worth of weapons to the regime, making Israel our eighth largest weapons market. British-made arms have been used against the Palestinians, including in airstrikes in Gaza. Britain has also been instrumental in shielding Israel from accountability for their crimes. Boris Johnson has opposed an international criminal court investigation into Israel's 2014 bombardment of Gaza. In a 2021 letter to the Conservative Friends of Israel, he wrote, We do not accept that the ICC has jurisdiction in this instance, given that Israel is not a party to the Statute of Rome and Palestine is not a sovereign state. Translation, because Israel won't agree to follow international law, they shouldn't be punished when they break it. And because Palestinians have been denied a state, they should have no means to stand up for themselves. So, our Tory government sells weapons to Israel and blocks investigations into how they are used. They also increasingly want to deny anyone the chance to protest that reality. In the 2019 Queen's speech, Boris Johnson's government announced their intention to ban public bodies from boycotting Israel. And according to Robert Jenrick, they want to make the BDS ban, quote, absolute. 
Just last week, Education Secretary Nadim Zahawi said those using the chant, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, could face legal action. Ironically, this comes precisely at the moment that Amnesty, Human Rights Watch and Bet Salem have all judged there to be only one regime from the river to the sea. It's apartheid Israel. Calling for Palestinians across that territory to be free seems pretty goddamn sensible. So, we might ask, why are Britain's politicians so keen to defend a country labelled an apartheid state by the world's leading human rights organisations? Well, no doubt it's in large part because we see the Israelis as furthering British interests in the Middle East. But the reasons could also be more personal. According to Declassified UK, a third of Boris Johnson's cabinet, including Johnson himself, have been funded by Israel or pro-Israel lobby groups. And the connections don't stop there. In November 2017, Priti Patel, who was International Development Secretary, was forced to quit her cabinet post after it came to light that she had secret meetings with Israeli politicians, including Benjamin Netanyahu. She, of course, bounced back to become the current Home Secretary. Boris Johnson in 2004 also took a trip to Israel that was funded by the Israeli government and the Westminster lobby group Conservative Friends of Israel. It took him four years to declare the trip in the Register of Members' Interests. Finally, we can look at Michael Gove. In 2017, Gove received more than £3,000 from APAC, the largest Israeli lobby group in the US. And here he is, speaking at the Conservative Friends of Israel business lunch in 2017. A beacon of democracy in the Middle East, a land of laws and liberty in a region scarred by extremist ideology and military oppression, an incubator of life-saving technologies and liberating innovation in a neighbourhood where others hold lives cheap and want to keep people in a state of medieval servitude, and a home for the Jewish people who at last have a land they can call their own after millennia of prejudice and oppression long centuries when their very existence was under threat. Israel truly is a light to the world. A light to the world, which just so happens to practice apartheid. Of course, support for Israel is not just a Tory thing. Since the toppling of Jeremy Corbyn, it enjoys bipartisan consensus. On previous shows, we've discussed how Keir Starmer believes Israel made the desert bloom. And now, following Amnesty's report into apartheid, NEC member Luke Akehurst has claimed Amnesty's apartheid slur is an attack on Jewish self-determination. Now, I still do find the, I mean, the consensus, the near consensus at the top of British politics here, incredible. And especially as we are seeing all of these human rights organizations coming out, they haven't said this for a long time. Obviously, people on the ground in Palestine have been saying, we live in an apartheid regime for a very long time. It's only recently that these incredibly mainstream human rights organizations, including Amnesty International, which has about 10 million members, by far the biggest human rights organization in the world, are saying, you know, in black and white, this is an apartheid regime. It's at that point that you might think that you would see the parties competing over who is more supportive or, or who is more implicated in that apartheid. So I would hope to see, you know, in a civilized country that you've got the Labour Party saying, look, guys, why did you send, why did you sell these weapons to, to Israel? Why are you accepting donations from Israel? Why did you have secret meetings with Israeli politicians? Those are the kind of questions which would be thrown around if we were talking about an enemy of Britain like Iran or potentially even China. But because this is a British ally, no. And in fact, this isn't just something which is going unnoted by our political leaders. It's not just that this is being brushed under the carpet. No, our political leaders actively celebrate their relationship to the Israeli government, which is practicing apartheid. And they don't just celebrate that relationship, they try and suppress the right of anyone else to have a different opinion. You see Keir Starmer now as leader of the Labour Party because of what happened under Jeremy Corbyn. He has to say, oh, the Palestinian movement, it's full of anti-Semites. Um, it, it's inherently suspicious if anyone thinks that Zionism might be an ideology which has some problems inherent to it. He's absolutely dismissive of anyone fighting for the Palestinian cause. You've got Luke Akehurst, not just someone who sat on the NEC, by the way. He was the person who got the most individual votes in that election. He actively 
works for an, an Israeli lobby group. We believe in Israel. And as you've seen there, he is not just saying, oh, it's a bit awkward that Amnesty International have, have called Israel apartheid. I better keep quiet on this for a couple of weeks. No, he's come out next day and said, this is a slur from Amnesty International. This is a slur. And that's what we hear over and over again. Uh, no one seriously wants to engage in the facts of the matter and say, oh, no, no, uh, Palestinians, they do have equal rights because no, they don't. They clearly don't have equal rights. They're occupied in parts of historic Palestine. In Israel, even if they have citizenship, they, they're treated as second-class citizens. In, in Gaza, they're bombed every five years, right? So these are not a people with equal rights. And that's not an argument that anyone whose job it is or anyone who has an interest in defending Israel will make. So instead, they say, oh, apartheid, that's a slur. If you call Israel apartheid, that's anti-Semitic. They can't deal with the information which is documented in this report by Amnesty International and was documented last year in a report by Betzalem and a report by Human Rights Watch, because the facts on the ground are obvious. All they can do is try and dismiss the people talking about these truths as racist or as politically motivated, as obsessed with Israel and Palestine, because the facts are clear. And, you know, despite, I think, the, the work of people like Luke Gatehurst, the words of people like Keir Starmer, the legislative ambitions of the conservative government, the public is realizing that our politicians are so, so out of step when it comes to Israel-Palestine with the general public that there should be an opportunity here for, for campaigners. And I mean, it's a shame um, because it, it, it could have been an opportunity that was taken by Jeremy Corbyn, but obviously Labour backbenchers and the media combined to mean that was not in any way a possibility. We are launching something new. It's called The Pick, and it will be a weekly newsletter delivering our best articles from navaramedia.com. You can sign up now by going to navara.media slash the pick. If you do so, which I recommend you do, you can expect first-person accounts, political analysis and reporting that you are unlikely to find anywhere else. And that link I mentioned is in the description box below if you want to sign up. After the publication of the Sue Gray report into Downing Street parties, Boris Johnson said this to Keir Starmer in the House of Commons. We spent most of his time prosecuting journalists and failing to prosecute Jimmy Savile, as far as I can make that, Mr Speaker. That was a smear. While Keir Starmer was director of public prosecutions when it chose not to prosecute the case, he had no direct relationship, no direct involvement in that decision. And when the decision was made, Starmer had only been DPP for a year. So it's difficult to say, well, this was the culture he created. All that means that Boris Johnson is not making a genuine point there. He is tapping into a right-wing meme that somehow Starmer let Savile off and he didn't. Evidence of the tenuousness of Johnson's attack was that his cabinet colleague, Dominic Raab, refused to repeat it the following day. I'm, I'm certainly not repeating it. I, I don't have the facts. Well, why wouldn't you repeat it if the Prime Minister I, believes it? Why well, wouldn't you repeat it? Look, I, I'm not repeating it. But one thing I would say, though, Nick... No, 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 no. Yeah. The no, Prime not, Minister not, I, don't, I don't have the facts to makes, justify that. Well, does he have the facts? But that's for, for him to... Be, but all I'm does saying is Does any minister that, have you're asked, evidence... Of what the Prime Minister said under the protection of parliamentary well, privilege. I, I haven't done a trawl of uh, ministers to, to check that. What I'm saying to you is that, that I can't... Well, uh, we can get him in if you like. You are his deputy. Okay. Who else do you want me to ask? So, well, Nick, you can ask me and I'm saying I can't uh, substantiate that. Tory MPs even tweeted calling Boris Johnson out for the smear. Julian Smith is a former chief whip. He wrote, The smear made against Keir Starmer relating to Jimmy Savile yesterday is wrong and cannot be defended. It should be withdrawn. False and baseless personal slurs are dangerous, corrode trust, and can't just be accepted as part of the cut and thrust of parliamentary debate. In terms of the impact of all this, there are two theories about how this will affect Starmer and Johnson. One is that by saying what was clearly a smear in Parliament, Boris Johnson only furthers the impression that he's a cynical liar. The other theory is that it really doesn't matter whether journalists and politicians debunk Johnson's claim. On the day after a report into government rule breaking, there was a public debate about Keir Starmer and a prolific paedophile. And for Boris Johnson, of course, that's a good thing. Personally, I think the jury's out on what the consequence of all this will be. It could go either way. What's clear already, though, is that Keir Starmer is playing to different rules than his predecessor. When Starmer was smeared by the Prime Minister, Tory backbenchers defended him. 
When Corbyn was smeared, his own backbenchers would join in. This double standard doesn't just concern MPs. Britain's well-paid centrist profits have suddenly also come to the realisation that smears are bad. LBC host James O'Brien tweeted, The Savile lie is the most Trumpish yet, I think. Every sentient Tory MP knows he's lying, but they can't call it out without calling Johnson a liar, and they can't do that without unhitching themselves from him. The ones who find the courage to do the right thing should be thanked. It is, of course, fantastic that James O'Brien is now calling out politically motivated smears. But it's notable how these comments from the author of books, including How to Be Right and How Not to Be Wrong, contrast with what he had to say for the four years Jeremy Corbyn was leader of the opposition. In 2016, he tweeted, Do you think Putin could get Corbyn into Downing Street? In brackets, Vladimir, if you're reading this, it's a theoretical question, not a challenge. In 2018, he tweeted, You're perfectly entitled to be untroubled by the fact that a KKK leader thinks he's on the same team as Corbyn regarding, quote, Jewish establishment power. But telling other people that they're not allowed to find it deeply disturbing is a bit, well, fascistic. So, in 2018, calling out smears was fascistic. But in 2021, when you happen to like the leader of the opposition, anyone who doesn't call out smears should be ashamed. Finally, in the mis misinformation stakes, this is right up there from 2019. Putin's got Farage and Seamus Milne doing his bidding. A ridiculous conspiracy theory repeated by James O'Brien you know, in the year when it mattered, when Jeremy Corbyn was still Labour leader and there was a general election coming up. Of course, more significant than what James O'Brien said on his Twitter feed was what he said on his LBC show. That was to 1.3 million weekly listeners. But it would take, of course, a whole show to go through the bullshit he spouted there. We're not going to do that. I don't have time because I have one more centrist prophet to show you. Otto English is the pen name of writer and journalist Andrew Scott. He came to fame writing anti-Brexit diatribes in Politico and the Byline Times. After Johnson's Savile smear, he tweeted, I have no beef with those on the left who dislike Starmer, personal choice and all. But if you are continuing to deliberately spread disinformation about him and Savile, despite all the evidence proving that the story is nonsense, well, you're no better than Johnson. Now, I personally saw barely anyone on the left buy into the Starmer Savile smear. But we can see why Otto English might be particularly sensitive to these things. He is, after all, a specialist in fake news. He recently published this, fake history, 10 great lies and how they shaped the world. And the advert for the book promises it will reveal, quote, the facts behind the fiction. Unfortunately, Otto wasn't so fastidious with the facts when it came to a politician he didn't happen to like. When the smear that Corbyn laid a reef to terrorists was promoted by the right-wing press, Otto attacked those standing up to them, tweeting, thinking of laying a reef to Owen Jones' career if this all goes on much longer. He then shared this. It's a Fred supposedly proving Corbyn was present at the graves of, quote, Black September terrorists. Sharing this, English tweeted, amazing Fred on Jeremy Corbyn and that reef. When called out about the inaccuracies in that Fred, English admitted it contained errors. And in response to my colleague Aaron, he said, reading about it now, with all the information available, and you are quite right, he was totally stitched up. Of course, being willing to correct errors is a good quality, but after four years, it's a little late. As context, if you're lucky enough to have forgotten the ordeal, the reef story was a central smear leveled at Jeremy Corbyn. The Daily Mail claimed Corbyn had laid a reef to anti-Semitic terrorists in Tunisia. He had, in fact, attended a memorial for members of the Palestinian Liberation Organization killed in an illegal Israeli airstrike. The smear was based on misinformation, but it was effective because, one, Labour MPs and Liberal journalists repeated it, and two, it preyed on the electorate's basest assumptions. Corbyn was supportive of liberation movements in the global south. Therefore, he sympathised with terrorists, therefore he was an extremist, therefore he hated Britain. Those broader terrorist 
and extremist smears were ones liberals like Otto English were more than happy to support when it mattered. In 2019, he tweeted, I condemn absolutely anyone who unequivocally supports terrorist organizations. That's one reason why I don't vote Labour anymore. I think Corbyn's unrequited support for terrorist groups is utterly beneath contempt. Just one year earlier, he had declared, the truth is that on Russia and Syria and Brexit, next to nothing divides Nick Griffin and Jeremy Corbyn. Might be unpopular to point this out, but there you go. Now, I've given you two examples there, Otto English and James O'Brien. Not necessarily people who should occupy too much of your time when you're sort of analysing politics and, and working out what's going on. But I do think this is incredibly significant. Because while I don't, you know, I don't like to obsess about the past five years because, you know, one, it's incredibly frustrating and also I think it's, it's better to look into the future. I do think the role that the liberal media and actually more than anyone, centrist Labour MPs played in furthering the smears against Jeremy Corbyn and, you know, anything that was thrown at him by the Conservatives or by the right-wing press, they repeated. And for me, that's why it's stuck. Because with Keir Starmer, as I say, I don't know which way this is going to go. It could be the case that now people associate him with Jimmy Savile and some of them don't vote for him. I doubt many people who, you know, take that seriously would have voted for him anyway. What happened with Jeremy Corbyn was, was quite different because it wasn't just people saying, oh, right-wingers think Jeremy Corbyn is a terrorist sympathizer. Right-wingers think Jeremy Corbyn is an anti-Semite. I don't really respect them anyway, so I don't believe them. I think that, that's what will probably happen with Keir Starmer in this story, because it's only Boris Johnson and some of the most, well, in this case, you know, the most obviously right-wing papers that are saying it. So if you are inclined to vote Labour, you'll say, well, they're only saying that because it's Boris Johnson, he's the opposition. They're only saying that because these are the right-wing papers and they would hate Labour anyway. Why people found it believable with Jeremy Corbyn was because they said, well, these smears which begun in the Daily Mail, they're now being repeated by the, 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 the liberal guy I listen to on LBC. They're now being repeated by Labour backbenchers. If all of these people, who in my vision of politics, where you have the left and the right, if all these people on Corbyn's side thinks he's dodgy, thinks he's a terrorist sympathiser, thinks he's an anti-Semite, then maybe it is true. And that's why, to my mind, when it comes to the downfall of, of Corbyn and, you know, the hit job, essentially, that the British establishment managed to play on him, it is people like the James O'Briens, the people like the Otto English, the people like the Labour backbench MPs, who probably have more responsibility than, than anyone else. Because the people who, you know, if you've said your whole life, my ambition is to destroy the possibility of socialism in this country, if you've said your whole life, look, I hate the left and I hate the Labour Party, then when you successfully manage to undermine the prospects of Jeremy Corbyn as Labour leader, you know, I disagree with you, but you know, fair play. That's your side. That's what you've always stated that you wanted to do. You've always said you want to destroy the left and the possibility of a progressive government in Britain. And you did it. When it comes to Labour backbenchers, when it comes to these liberal pundits, they are people who will now say, oh, Boris Johnson, how did we end up with this prime minister? And we ended up with this prime minister because when the Murdoch press made stuff up about the Labour leader, when there were conservative attack ads against the Labour leader, which were completely based in fiction, and by the way, you know, appealing to the basest, most racist, xenophobic, cruel assumptions of, of parts of the British electorate, you didn't say, wait a minute, maybe they're smearing this guy. Maybe we shouldn't trust um, Britain's oligarchs, right-wing press and conservatives when it comes to judging a guy. Maybe we should look a bit deeper into these claims instead of mindlessly repeating them. But no, they mindlessly repeated them. They mindlessly repeated those smears. They took the Times, they took the Daily Mail at face value, all of these people who were supposed to have critical thinking, and now we have Boris Johnson as Prime Minister. And what will happen, actually, this happened with the conversation between Aaron and, and Otto English. Otto English said, well, by the way, look, if, you, if you look up Corbyn Reef from my Twitter, then you'll see that actually on one occasion I did stick up for him. The occasion he stuck up for him was when there was that ridiculous story about either did Corbyn bend low enough at the um, cenotaph, or there was another story I think about the anorak he wore um, to the cenotaph, and Otto English is saying, no, I spoke out against that smear. But that doesn't really count for much. And you hear this a lot. People say, oh no, I spoke out. Lots of people say, I spoke out about the Czech spy smear. But if you only spoke out about the most obvious smears, the ones which were clearly untrue, and all of the ones which had, you know, because you know, the best smears have a tiny element of truth. 
right? Keir Starmer was leader of the CPS when they didn't prosecute Jimmy Savile. That's not completely outlandish as a claim, but it counts as a smear because what Boris Johnson is trying to do is create an association between Jimmy Savile and Keir Starmer in the public's minds, which if you look at the full information in front of you, is not justified. Keir Starmer had been director of public prosecutions for a year when Jimmy Savile wasn't prosecuted. I don't think anyone's suggesting that anyone, you know, personally made a decision which was, you know, corrupt or which was intentionally letting him off. And afterwards, Keir Starmer admitted, look, there's something that went wrong in this organisation. We're going to have a review of this. He apologised on behalf of the CPS. So it's not a complete lie in the same way that the Czech spy one was. And these smears that I've just talked about against about Corbyn, you know, he did go to a cemetery where people who were very high up members of the PLO were buried. Now, some people think that high up members of the PLO were terrorists, right? Because they, you know, most people who were part of liberation movements, by the way, unless they were completely 100% committed to nonviolence, there will be many people who consider them terrorists, right? So there is an element of truth to that. But if you look at the full context, why is this the association that people have of Corbyn with terrorists fair? No, Corbyn was associating with the PLO, which was, by the way, the legitimately recognized representative of the Palestinian people by the UN, amongst others. Now, there were some people in that graveyard who some people will disagree with, but essentially you have a politician visiting, you know, what I think is overwhelmingly a uh, uh, a group which, uh, a bunch of freedom fighters, right? When Tony Blair spoke at Ariel Sharon's funeral, you didn't have this huge smear campaign saying Tony Blair is best friends with with murderers, even though Ariel Sharon is is a murderer. You know, he, he, he has been found guilty by the Israeli authorities themselves of being implicated in a, a massacre where thousands of Palestinians were killed. But he didn't get smeared for that because anyone other than Jeremy Corbyn is allowed to have complicated relationships when it comes to international politics. We're always said, oh, you can't be purist about these things. You have to be practical. You have to be pragmatic when you're dealing with um, you know, political movements or governments abroad. The moment it's a socialist, have you ever spoken to anyone who's carried out an act which we find distasteful? Then you're a terrorist sympathizer and you should be nowhere near power. That's essentially what we were told. And that is the lie that all of these liberal pundits loads of Labour right-wing backbench MPs bought into. And so when Corbyn was seen as anti-patriotic, as a terrorist sympathiser, when there were members of the army doing shooting practice with his face, it's no good to just say, oh, well, I called it out when they called him a Czech spy. No, you have to also call out the ones which were more powerful because they weren't obviously outlandish lies. They were just completely misleading, which is the case with Keir Starmer and Jimmy Savile. And Otto English and James O'Brien haven't now come out and said, well, actually, he was leader of the CPS when this happened. No, because it's an association which isn't warranted. And so they're not, they're not doing that. But they didn't, I suppose, show the same critical faculties, the, the, the same level of independent thought when it came to Jeremy Corbyn because they didn't like the guy. Let's go to a few more comments. Like a tweets on the hashtag Tisky Sour, read the Savile smears. It's not necessarily just about stopping people voting Labour. It's also potentially about motivating Tory voters to come out to vote and vote Tory rather than reform UK. That could still work without left or liberal buy-in. Yeah, interesting point. I, I, I would accept that as being a possibility. In terms of motivating people to go out to vote, whether or not this tenuous link to Jimmy Savile is going to be enough, I'm not sure. You know, obviously the fear people have is that the QAnon conspiracies in the United States ended up being quite powerful. If they become mainstreamed among a, you know, a subsection of the British population, could that be damaging? Potentially. As I say, I, I don't necessarily think this isn't a problem for Keir Starmer, but it's definitely less of a problem for Keir Starmer than it was for Jeremy Corbyn, because in Keir Starmer's case, liberals are still engaging their critical faculties. They're saying, wow, maybe if the murder cone press, maybe if the Daily Mail are saying it, maybe if Boris Johnson's saying it, it's not necessarily true. Whereas when it was Jeremy Corbyn, I said, well, there is an element of truth to this, isn't there? Let's do a two hour long radio show on it. Oliver Kant with a fiver. The Labour right got what they wanted and now they're mad. We say now they're mad. I think they're actually quite delighted. You know, as I say, there were people saying, you know, this is centrists reaping what they sowed. You know, they were the ones who justified and legitimized this kind of smear, this kind of fake news, and now it's happening to them. On one level, that's kind of true, but I don't think 
that they are necessarily now going to be victims of what Corbyn was because the centre, the centrists in Labour have a lot more structural power than Corbyn did when he was leader. When Corbyn was leader, he had backbench MPs against him. He had even the Liberal media against him. Corbyn, sorry, Keir Starmer, his backbench MPs are much more disciplined. They, they don't hate his politics because he's not particularly left-wing. He's not an anti-imperialist. He's not necessarily a socialist. So they're happy to go along with whatever he says. If Boris Johnson makes up something about him, they'll debunk it. The Guardian will, will debunk it. Even the BBC are debunking it, which we didn't see very often when it came to Jeremy Corbyn. So I do think the centre might unfortunately get away with it. We might not get poetic justice this time. Um, although that's saying, I don't, I don't want, I, I'm not here to try and make what happened to Jeremy Corbyn happen to Keir Starmer because the alternative is Boris Johnson. And, you know, I'm a bit more responsible than the James O'Briens of the world. Mike Green with a fiver. Starmer called Israel a boisterous democracy, FFS. What's wrong with him? I did a whole um, segment on Starmer's speech to Labour Friends of Israel. It was absolutely appalling. Um, probably the, the least respect I've ever had for Keir Starmer was after he delivered that speech. So you can check that out on our YouTube channel. And oh, that is unusual with two pounds. If you're in Eurovision, you shouldn't do genocide, IMO. Let's go to our next story. Johnson's Jimmy Savile slur against Keir Starmer has been met by outrage from a number of Tory MPs. And, quite right, it was outrageous. But perhaps as well as speaking out of principle, some are also concerned a focus on Jimmy Savile could backfire on the Conservatives. Because paedophile Jimmy Savile had a long history of friendships and influence with several Tory MPs, going all the way to the very top of the party. Hello, welcome. Come in. Hello. I must introduce um, all of friends. Hi, Lucy. You're I'm Lucy. Lucy. Um, when you were small, did you ever want to be the Prime Minister? No, when I was small, I don't think one ever thought that there could ever be a woman Prime Minister of Britain. You know, we didn't, Jimmy, in those days, did we? No, but we always helped. We always hoped, and, all and right. I thought you were going to fix my getting into number 10. I've already done so, but I was going to see you privately about that because I wouldn't want too many people to realise how I'd done it because they could all finish it for being private. Then you can give me a Jim. Well, Jim has fixed it for me. Indeed, all indeed. Right. That's Margaret Thatcher's 1977 appearance on Jim will fix it two years before she became Prime Minister. But Savile's relationship with Thatcher would last for decades. In 2012, a Downing Street file was released to the public which showed the depth of that friendship containing records of lunches and personal correspondence between the two. It also showed that Savile had twice been to Chequers to visit the Prime Minister. Savile was invited because of his fundraising efforts at Stoke Mandeville Hospital, a place now known to be one of many where he sexually molested children and other vulnerable patients. Because you as a disc jockey, and me as the king of the disc jockeys, we think we've got all the girls in the world, it's most of these guys in. They are the governors, because we get phone calls by the minute. Sometimes they've got girlfriends queuing up downstairs. We only let them in one at a time, you see. And the only reason I'm friendly with people like this is because I nick what he doesn't want. Savile there saying the only reason he's friendly with his male teenage patients is so that he can nick the underage girls who come to visit. At one of these lunches, Savile asked Thatcher for donations, both personal and from the government. That was to rebuild Stoke Mandeville's spinal injuries unit. Thatcher agreed. She gave her own money and later the government would chip in £500,000. He wrote her this thank you note. Dear Prime Minister, I waited a week before writing to thank you for my lunch invitation because I had such a superb time I didn't want to be too effusive. My girl patients pretended to be madly jealous and wanted to know what you wore and what you ate. All the paralysed lads called me Sir James all week. They all love you. Me too. Jimmy Savile. OBE. Kiss, kiss, kiss. Savile would go on to spend New Year's Eve with the, Thatch, with the Thatcher family on a number of occasions. In 1986, when Savile was rejected for a knighthood, Thatcher personally intervened. Thatcher instructed her private secretary to write to the cabinet office saying she wonders how many more times his name is to be pushed aside, especially in view of all the great work he has done for Stoke Mandeville. And it's not just Thatcher who's potentially implicated. In 1988, the then Health Secretary Ken Clark suspended the entire management board of Broadmoor Psychiatric Hospital. 
Saville, who had been volunteering at Broadmoor for a number of years, was put in charge of the task force that replaced the management. This was approved by junior health minister Edwina Curry. Essentially, Curry handed him the keys to a secure facility housing very vulnerable people. We are a great listening hospital. We listen to people. I listen to nurses. I listen to doctors. I listen to porters. I listen to drivers. I listen to everybody. We've turned into a great listening hospital. When asked why she had appointed him to the role, Curry later gave this explanation. What we were in the process of trying to do was improve the life of patients there because it was being run like a prison and many of them were there for a very long time without having been convicted of anything would eventually be um, able to go back to normal life. We wanted to improve the life of the people in there and so we asked various people chaired by a, a senior civil servant to give us some ideas on how they felt the life of patients could be improved. And Jimmy made an appointment to see me and um, so I'm full of ideas, I'm full of lots of ideas. And then what he came up with was actually quite odd. And looking at it now, okay. I think I can see what he was getting up to. He'd gone through the payroll and found out that some of the prison officers were paying themselves more than they were supposed to get. He had gone through How the property... How did he have access to the payroll? That's weird, isn't it? That's a good question. Yeah, okay. We had asked him to advise us on how to improve the lives because of... Patience. Okay, but it's been presented as that you put him in charge of a task force that were well, kind of running the place. That's no. He was not in charge. Okay. Civil servant was in charge. But Civil had you servant. appointed him to this task force? Do you know, I, I is my remem my memory of it is that he offered himself, okay. recommended himself, and you accepted him at the time. And I suppose sure, because everybody did. Yeah, you were, in a way you were duped by him as well because everybody was. In fact, when Saville told Curry his plans for reforming the hospital, which included union busting, Curry wrote, at a boy, in her diaries. Nor is it true that everyone was duped. Several staff within Broadmoor voiced their concerns about Saville. Well, I'd long considered him, as many of my colleagues did, as a man with a severe personality disorder, with, with a liking for children. What was the talk among staff? He was regarded as a paedophile. And, by, by you, by the but, professional staff. And the paedophile patients, many of those knew that he was a paedophile. I'd say he was a psychopath. I would actually say he was, he was without a doubt. It's just the way his attitude was, his, his, his blasé attitude to everything. He didn't seem to care or worry about anything. A lot of our staff always said he should be behind the bars. And we used to laugh about it in those days. Then, one night while patrolling the perimeter fence, Bob Allen stopped laughing. Jimmy Savile's car pulled into Broadmoor and parked outside the terraced house that he'd been given by the hospital. I actually saw him step out and he stepped out with a young girl. Did she um, look like a child? Did she look like a... She was certainly over 13, I would have said, um, but she was, she was, she was definitely not, not of an adult age. She, she was under 16, I would have said. That's the way I, that, that was the look that she had. Then Bob Allen noticed something else. The young girl had just taken part in a local village carnival. The girl had wore, was wearing a sash. Um, so she was obviously a girl off one of the floats that, from the carnival that day. I said, hello, Jim, and, and, and there was a, just a nod at me. There was no mention back. I just walked on and I watched him go into the house. I saw the lights go on. I carried on walking and I just kept on looking. I was thinking to myself at the time, you know, what's, what's going on here? Then Bob Allen saw the lights go off in the house. So you saw this, you, you felt that it was wrong, and wh what did you do about it? I went into our, our gated area where I saw my immediate superior then, and as far as I know, he reported it. And uh, the following day, I asked what was the outcome, and it was really just, well, nobody appears to be interested. Records of the NHS investigations into Savile show repeated cases of ordinary staff trying to draw him to the attention of the people at the top, but none seemed to take an interest. Indeed, Savile was knighted in 1990 after four failed attempts to make him a sir. Thatcher finally succeeded in her final year in office. It wouldn't be until 2012, a year after Savile's death, that the true scale of his crimes would become public 
knowledge. Inquiries began after a 2012 ITV documentary examined claims of sexual abuse against Savile. It would result in internal investigations at the BBC, the NHS, the Department of Health and the Crown Prosecution Service. Ultimately, over 450 suspected victims would come forward. 28 were children under 10 at the time of the abuse and 63 were girls between 13 and 16. Still, even then, top, Tory, top Tories couldn't stop themselves from defending him. In 2013, Norbert Tebbit, once a member of Thatcher's government and now in the Lords, told The Guardian, I've got no doubt Jimmy Savile was a very odd fellow and I'm pretty sure he was in breach of the law on a number of matters, but I do not know that it's possible 40 years on to do justice in the sense of knowing just how many of those allegations are complete and true. Jimmy did a great deal of good as well as wrong, and in anybody's life, you have to look at both sides of the ledger. Both sides of the ledger. God, for someone who abused multiple children... You cannot look at both sides of the ledger. And also, it's just such a ridiculous thing to say, because what is the other side of the ledger? Oh, he did all of this charitable work. Well, we know now the charitable work was to get access to children so that he could abuse them, or to corpses so that he could abuse them. There aren't two sides to this ledger. And for someone to say that in 2013, like, wow. And what does that tell you as well? If you know, because the claim that is made, right, by people who should have known, people who should have known what Jimmy Savile was up to, they were saying, well, clearly we didn't know, because if we did know, we would have been so shocked that we would have instantly gone to the authorities. And if they were the highest authorities, such as the prime minister or a cabinet member, they would have done something about it. Well, what does Norman Tebbit reveal here? That he actually, you know, it, it's now been presented to him in black and white what Jimmy Savile did, and he still doesn't think it's that big a deal. And, and that does make it plausible that they knew at the time and they didn't care because they didn't think that abusing multiple children in vulnerable situations was a red line. You know, this guy was a TV personality. He was making money for charity. Why shouldn't he get to abuse children? Now, obviously, I, I'm not saying Norbert Tebbit said those words. I'm not saying Margaret Thatcher said those words. But you do see here what seems like a minimizing of what happened. And if people are willing to minimize what happened now, or in 2013, after these revelations came out, then it's very easy to imagine how they would have minimized them if they knew about them at the time. And what you saw from those interviews with, with members of, of staff in places where Jimmy Savile worked, or where he was placed, or where he volunteered, or where he was you know, given a chairman role when it came to hiring people, they were saying, we all knew, we told people above us, and they didn't care. Now, as I say, I don't know all of the details of this, partly because Britain hasn't had a proper reckoning with this. I mean, this to me deserves a full public inquiry. But it's, I mean, I, maybe there are too many people who want this to be brushed under the carpet, and so, so that won't happen. Too many people are implicated. That's quite possible. But it seems plausible to me that if you've got those people who are in staff, they're telling their management about it and their management don't care. One possibility is that you know every manager in all of these institutions was a sociopath who didn't care that you had... Jimmy Savile walking around abusing children. The other possibility is some of them weren't sociopaths and they tried to go to the people above them, right? And it was the people above them who said, oh no, actually, we don't want to look into this. Actually, can you just shut your staff up? This isn't a big deal. Or it could even have been the, the people above them. Because I think if someone gets away with something to this extent, you either have to have loads and loads and loads of sociopaths in middle management, or the problem goes, right to the top. And, you know, I have too much faith in, in, in humanity to think that there were that many sociopaths in middle management. So I think it probably went to the top. And who was the top during that period of time? Well, it was mostly Margaret Thatcher. It was mostly the Conservatives. And now you have the sight of Boris Johnson standing up in Parliament after saying that investigations into historic child abuse was just spaffing money up the wall. Now he's saying, ah, Jimmy Savile, that's Keir Starmer's problem. Well, even if Keir Starmer was director of public prosecutions for a year when they decided to not properly investigate Jimmy Savile, obviously they should have done. He then went to review it afterwards and apologized on behalf of the CPS for that. Boris Johnson has no right to stand up and make that claim about anyone else because 
it's it's his party more than anyone else that is implicated in this. And he has demonstrated by those words about spaffing money up the wall that he has absolutely no interest or whatsoever in one, achieving any justice for these children or, or the multiple other people that Jimmy Savile abused. And two, has no interest in making sure this will never happen again. Because unless you work out what really happened, who were the people who were told about this and then who told people to shut up about it? Oh, we don't look into that. Who were they? How were they allowed to get away with it? Unless we have solid answers to those questions, then it's going to be very difficult to make sure this, this won't happen again. And I personally don't have much confidence that, you know, maybe not to the extent of this, you know, with, with, with social media and much more sort of ability for people to whistleblow, maybe some of those staff, if they had Twitter, maybe one of them would have contacted a journalist, for example. I think something to this scale probably is much less likely now than it was then. But I have absolutely no confidence whatsoever that the British establishment has been serious enough when it's asked, or I mean, it's failed to ask, frankly, how was this able to happen, that something along these lines, even if not as extreme, will be able to happen again. And that, not not Keir Starmer being director of the CPS for, for a year at the point when this was not investigated, you know, in the late 2000s. You know, maybe there's a problem there, but the much bigger problem is that this was allowed to happen for decades when it seems kind of implausible that not a lot of people in very powerful positions had at least an idea of what was going on and thought this is not worth the time. It's not worth intervening. Let's just let it happen. Thank you so much for joining me this evening. And we'll be back on Friday at 7pm. You've been watching Tisky Sour on Navarra Media. Good night. 